Hello everyone and welcome to Protocol Value Podcast. Tonight we have an exceptional guest from Twitter community. He is Chainlink Community Ambassador. He is Decentralized Middleware Realist. He is also a co-author of Smart Content. And throughout the last couple of years, he has been breaking down the information asymmetry regarding Chainlink protocol, as well as the smart contract economy. I present to you none other than Chainlink God himself. Welcome, sir. How are you? Thank you for having me on. Glad to uh, share the knowledge that I've accumulated over the years on Chainlink. Absolutely. We're breaking down the information asymmetry. Yeah. I mean, it's it's wider than you could ever imagine, really. Yeah. Uh, especially with the Chainlink white paper 2.0, which mm. we will get in a moment. But tell us how you got into the blockchain. What drove your curiosity? How you became what you are today? Yeah. So that, that started, like, I would say, I got a little bit interested in 2017, you know, everywhere in the media, that's all you saw. Uh, but specifically in like beginning of 2018, I, I was like a gamer at the time. So I noticed GPU prices were absolutely insane, like double MSRP, it was mm -hmm. ridiculous. So I kind of looked into like, why is that happening? And everybody was pissed at the crypto miners. And I saw that like, you could just run a program on your computer and money comes out. Like I thought that was incredible. So I, I started doing that, but like w w once you start printing this money, then you start asking questions like, all right, why is this worth something? How am I actually creating money? W what is my computer actually doing? So I kind of fell down the rabbit hole, like at the beginning of 2018, mm -hmm. kind of the same path most people do, going from Bitcoin, then going to Ethereum, and then a little bit of shit coins, and then, you know, accumulating your knowledge further and further. And eventually I basically conceptualized or wondered how contracts could be connected to the real world. Like I knew that was an issue since I started learning about smart contracts, but it wasn't until like later that year that I got more into Chainlink and then started digging into the information there. But I would say like the, the main thing that really stood out to me about blockchain is not like necessarily crypto as a money, which is cool, but it's really like crypto as a form of economic automation. So I just see smart contracts as like a new backend for the global economy, essentially. So smart contracts was definitely what drew me in into blockchain. And that's why I'm still here. If it was just Bitcoin, I probably still wouldn't be as involved in crypto as I am now. So smart contracts, it's a very interesting and relatively new concept within a technology itself and also within blockchain space. And essentially what powers the current infrastructure of DeFi. So how did smart contract originate? What is it? So a smart contract, you can basically think of it as like an if X, then Y piece of code, essentially. And it started very simple on Bitcoin. You could consider that a very simple smart contract. You can transfer Bitcoin around, you can receive it, you can send it. It's a very simple contract. And it got a little more evolved on Bitcoin with like a multi-signature where you have multiple entities who have to sign off on a transaction. And, you know, that you could think of that as a smart contract, but what most people refer to when they mean a smart contract is something like Ethereum, where it's a generalized smart contract, where it's written in code and you can write programmatic actions pretty much of how you define how users interact with this contract. So you can have like a decentralized exchange. If this contract receives a token, it'll give you a certain amount of a different token back. So it's, it's not an application run by a server, some basement, you know, Facebook or something, but instead it's an application that runs on a decentralized computer network. And that's the blockchain. And this blockchain hosts all of these different smart contract applications. And they're all, you know, connecting to each other, um, allowing users to gain access to more permissionless applications, applications that can't prevent you from interacting with them. So you can really think of it as like, like an application you use today on your computer, but it's one that runs on a decentralized network, meaning nobody can shut it down. Nobody can prevent you from using it. And it's something that's going to be continuously running as long as that network continues to exist. So it's like, it's the new form of computation that we didn't really have before. I mean, we kind of went from like mainframes to personal computers to mobile phones. Now we have blockchains and distributed computing, and it's this entire new 
uh, array of applications that, you know, we've only scraped the tip of the iceberg of what smart contract can actually do. And smart contracts on Ethereum blockchain in its infancy, essentially, stage can be thought of as open APIs, right? However, um, the one downside to smart contracts um, as what they are at right now, um, they cannot get information about the real world events uh, because they can't send HTTP requests. However, um, there are ways to get around this using oracles. And this is essentially where the chain link comes in. Right. Yeah. So with smart contracts, they are like isolated. They can talk to the same contracts on the same network, but because of the really strong security properties of the blockchain, it, it's purposely limited from external connections because that could be an attack vector mm -hmm. for uh, ruining the consensus of these transactions. So what you need is some entity to deliver that data on the behalf of the contract. And that entity is called an Oracle. And originally we had centralized Oracles like Oracleize, that was like a popular one for a while, where it's just a single server, you know, a contract creates a request, the Oracle sees that, fetches the data, like the price of ETH against USD, and then returns it back to the contract. But the problem there is that you have a single Oracle controlling your contract that basically defeats the entire purpose of using a decentralized smart contract in the first place. If that Oracle can just control your contract, like they could report that the price of ETH is a hundred billion dollars, you know, that's going to cause some damage for a lot of contracts. So and that's, what, and that's an example of what we've seen in centralized exchanges, such as Kraken when um, Ethereum price just essentially went from, I believe 1400 to 700 in, in an instant, and they were essentially relying on just a single Oracle, single feed, and it was centralized. And what you're saying is, whenever you do have this kind of centralized feed into a decentralized entity, um, such as smart contract, um, it defeats um, that decentralization purpose. Um, and essentially, um, you only validate the input from one source. Um, and that source can be manipulated. Right. And that's the whole argument regarding the um, consensus and uh, decentralization. Right. It's basically a single point of failure. We're trying to get away from that. We're trying to get away from like you need to trust a single entity. So really, the solution is similar to a blockchain. You decentralize it. You have a bunch of different oracles and they all fetch this data for you. Then they aggregate it into one value and then submit that one value. So if a handful of nodes are corrupted or they're malicious or they're offline, contract keeps running, contract still keeps getting data. So that decentralization is crucial. And that's kind of what we saw with the release of Chainlink, uh, on its mainnet in 2019, mm -hmm. is these decentralized oracles, which the, the primary one, or the primary most common use of oracles is price feeds for DeFi, because all that price data on centralized exchanges, decentralized exchanges, you need a single source, but that single source has to be a decentralized source mm -hmm. so it can actually become tamper resistant. So those price feeds are really the reason why we saw decentralized finance, DeFi, explode in adoption like we did is because there were trustworthy oracles worth using. If we had centralized oracles, DeFi really wouldn't exist the way it is today. It would essentially be just a, a copy of the finance 1.0 when you have centralized exchanges. Um, but even on the centralized exchanges um, in the finance 1.0, you're still able to aggregate the price feeds from raw price feeds from all the exchanges using different methodologies or different aggregators. Um, how does that aggregation or computation on a smart contract level happens within Chainlink? So with Chainlink, what they, for something like price feeds, there's multiple layers of aggregation. So first you have the raw exchange data. You have Binance, Coinbase, Uniswap, all this raw data. There's some wash trading, some of it's legitimate. It's kind of a mess. And then a layer above, you have the data aggregators. These are professional data um, aggregation firms who have refined aggregation strategies like taking the volume weighted average price across all of the exchanges. So that provides a uh, that, that provides market coverage so that their price actually accurately reflects the true 
state of the price of an asset. But clearly you can't just trust a single data aggregation firm. So each Chainlink node, which is the Oracle that delivers the data, they pull from multiple data aggregators and then they take the median value. So that way, if one of the data providers goes down or they're manipulated or something happens, they're still protected. And then a layer above that, you have an Oracle network aggregation where you use multiple chain like Oracle nodes and you aggregate that data together by taking a median. So a chain like price feed is basically a median of a median of a data point that reflects full market coverage of the entire trading market. And so that's very specific to price feeds, but that kind of aggregation can apply to any type of data. And that's something that used to happen on the blockchain, but that's kind of expensive because the blockchain is very decentralized. Mm -hmm. So Chainlink recently had an upgrade where it moved that aggregation off chain and it could do it for much, much cheaper. And that allowed for much more data to be delivered on chain. So there's, there's continual advancements to how aggregation works in the Chainlink network, but it's, it's improved by, I mean, the, the costs were lowered by 90% with this recent upgrade. So, you know, there's a lot of flexibility to how you aggregate your data, but for price feeds, it's pretty much follows that, mod that model. Essentially, it's uh, the, the cost is essentially the compounding effect of the more price fees you feed into the smart contract, the bigger the cost of calculating the medium would be. Um, and to my understanding, that's the reason primarily because they use so many different sources for so many different assets. Um, the calculation on chain, specifically Ethereum would be in this example, uh, the gas cost would be saving a tremendous amount of value and money if that would have been essentially shipped to off-chain computation. Right, yeah. So the primary reason off-chain reporting, that's what that scalability upgrade was called. Mm -hmm. The reason it was created is because the adoption of Ethereum just exploded and network congestion shot through the roof, which means transaction fees got very expensive. So if you have a network with 21 Oracle nodes and they all submit their data on-chain, you have to order it first and then you have to take the median value. And the more Oracles you add, the more expensive that uh, ordering and taking the median value becomes. But mm -hmm. if you could do that whole process off chain and then instead just deliver the aggregated value on chain and take the median, that is much, much cheaper. And that's how chain like price feeds work now. And now that's why there's over 150 price feeds on Ethereum mainnet. Even though transactions are expensive, the costs were lowered by so much that more feeds can be launched now. So we're going to see more and more of these uh, computations of a contract start moving off chain because it's much cheaper. And then you just settle on the blockchain when you need to, to get that uh, final trust assumption, that final settlement guarantee. So we'll see a lot more Oracle stuff happening where a computation moves off chain with aggregation being one of those. So essentially a net net result in a somewhat near future or even a long-term future, we would have to expect um, given this update, a series of updates, the gas costs for computation um, would be lower just due to the design architecture being moved essentially off chain. But Chainlink is not only famous for the centralized Oracle networks, which is essentially powering the price feeds, uh, which they are expanding to even different asset classes at this point, uh, feeding some of the equity um, feeds from decentralized aggregators and other entities. But they also um, have Chainlink VRF, which um, probably a fair randomness for blockchain gaming maps. How does that fit within the universe of Chainlink offering? Sure. So I think to provide some context, a blockchain on, with its, itself can't generate a secure uh, source of randomness. Either you have to have like the miners do it, but then they can manipulate it or you can have some off-chain entity delivering it, but there's no way to tell if that randomness was actually random or not because you know, manipulated randomness just looks like randomness if you have no way to prove it. So what Chainlink offers is a verifiable random function, which is like a, it's a complex math function where you input a seed value, it generates a random value and a cryptographic proof. You post those on-chain and then you can verify that the random value was actually generated based on the original seed value given, meaning it can't be manipulated by any entities. You have a cryptographic proof 
that this randomness was correct. And randomness, it might seem like a small thing, but mm -hmm. it's actually significant for you know gaming applications. If you have a rare item, you want to actually know that it's rare. So that rarity, you know, like a the drop rate of an item, mm -hmm. that depends on an, a randomness function. And so Chainlink VRF can be used as that randomness function to provide users a very strong guarantee that their items are provably rare because it was minted using this randomness function that can't be manipulated. And we're kind of seeing that not just with gaming, but also with uh, non-fungible tokens, NFTs, which <laughs> blew up a lot recently, <laughs> where you can use uh, randomness to create a new NFT with random attributes, random traits. You can distribute that NFT in a verifiably random manner. So it basically gamifies these NFTs. It makes them more dynamic, um, not entirely static, but can change according to randomness that can't be manipulated by a single entity. Because if you can manipulate that randomness, that NFT is worthless, basically, because you know, anybody can mint any type of NFT they want and say it's random, but if you don't have a cryptographic proof backing it, then nobody can actually verify if you just sent a value that looked random, but wasn't. So chain like VRF is basically solving the randomness issue on the blockchain, which is important for gaming, for NFTs, and also for like unique things like a no loss lotteries where money is pooled into a money market and all the interest gets awarded to the uh, some random winner and then everybody who deposited can withdraw their original funds so there's like entirely unique concepts that mm -hmm. can be created using randomness yeah randomness plays a big role um in the kind of the idea generation for DeFi applications like you mentioned um the random lotteries where different users pull together funds and essentially a random user is picked to uh, become a winner. Um, the fascinating thing about the randomness um, is that it has a real world applications in the real world games, um, just not only to receive a certain item with a generated um, um, probably a fair and verifiable randomness probability, uh, but also um, whenever somebody buys a loot box, for example, right? Um, we see in majority of the games, we see a probability of some of the items dropping, right? And this would be a real world application, which I'm really excited for because there's been a lot of talk on the regulatory side um, to make sure that this side of the development is actually transparent to the user. Because a lot of uh, front-end users, like gamers, kids, um, get addicted to this kind of environment um, and essentially bargain their own family money in order to gain some of the items. But I see this as if Chainlink would implement this randomness in the, in the real world gaming environment, um, this would solidify it not only from the user perspective, but also from the regulatory perspective. Yeah, I would entirely agree. I think a lot of, you know, a lot of games, they're created by a centralized entity and that publisher, they can change the game however they want. They may tell you, yeah, this item's, you know, you can get one in one millionth chance of getting it in this loot box. But really, you're just trusting them that they're not manipulating you, that they're not just lying. You have no way to verify. But if you could use Chainlink VRF and you have a cryptographic proof that verifies that that randomness wasn't manipulated, then not only is that like a better user experience, but they actually have higher guarantees of the value of an item that's supposed to be rare. And like on the regulatory aspect, you know, we have things like the state lottery where Chainlink had a hackathon recently with the Colorado state lottery, mm -hmm. where you're able to, you know, create these more official lottery systems using VRF to choose the winners, you know, because we see things like the, the McDonald's scratch lottery thing and that, that, that was manipulated for tens of millions of dollars because it wasn't actually verifiable. But if we, are able to create these lotteries, these applications, any type of application that needs randomness, like selecting uh, jurors uh, for a court case, or you know, choosing pretty much any you know, like random samples for a scientific study. You need randomness for that. So Chainlink VRF 
it, it's great for smart contracts, but it's also great for everything off chain as well that needs cryptographic proof that something is random and it could be published on chain. Therefore, anybody can verify it. It's completely transparent. Anybody can audit it to actually verify that this randomness was random. So I think randomness, it'll see it. It's, it's already seeing its product market fit in NFTs and gaming. Mm. But I think these off chain applications and services, that's just going to be the next stepping stone to making the world verifiable, essentially. So I, th I think that's the next large avenue for FreeRF. This is essentially truly incredible because by having this conversation with you, I'm starting to realize that Chainlink has a possibility to not only be a market provider for of this type of the technology, but also be a regulator, um, an entity that essentially regulates um, decentralized Oracle networks, which essentially what Chainlink White Paper 2.0 introduces us into this new world. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's so much like regulatory because that's mm -hmm. like that has a defined meaning, but I would say it provides entities like regulatories the tools they need to actually set up the systems they want in a verifiable manner. So like when you think of more of like a governance aspect, the Chainlink network isn't like a single network. It's not a monolithic network like a blockchain, mm -hmm. but it's actually like a framework for creating lots of different networks lots of different Oracle networks and each Oracle network can have a different purpose. It can have a different governance system. It can, you know, some may do randomness, some may do proof of reserve, some may do price feeds. Each one has like a specific purpose to it. And the governance of each one can be defined by the person who needs the data essentially. So it's Oracle technology. It's something that's going to be used by all entities. Regulatory will be one aspect of that. We already see like KYC and AML oracles launching. So mm -hmm. if an enterprise wants to be regulatory compliant and use smart contracts, they can use that chain like Oracle to make sure the addresses they interact with are blacklisted by you know a federal agency. So mm -hmm. you know it's, it's all kind of opt in. But if you want to deliver that type of data to help regulatories, you can do that. You know, it's you could deliver any type of data you need, any type of data you would ever possibly imagine. Essentially, um, one of the also side projects or um, a side features of Chainlink is proof of reserve, um, where they're able to essentially um, use a decentralized manner to compute those reserves and pass it on to potentially regulatory bodies. But I want to mainly talk about Chainlink. 2.0 white paper and the meta layer that dons the centralized Oracle networks because essentially Chainlink with this new white paper um, introduces us to a whole new world of possibilities of scaling into multiple different directions and essentially laying out a multi-year plan of where the team is striving to become within a couple of years and it seems like they're still refining it um, as they're writing it. Um, that's kind of the, the vibe that I'm getting. But they've introduced several new important factors. Hybrid smart contracts, scaling, abstracting away complexity, confidentiality, order fairness, trust minimization, and the crypto economic security. And obviously, they've mentioned some of the staking part of it, which majority of people who are currently listening are excited to hear that staking is coming to Chainlink. But let's talk about Don's hybrid smart contracts and um, other things first. Sure, yeah. So what, what this paper kind of tries to, you know, it, its goal is to expand what an Oracle is. So everybody kind of knows an Oracle, it delivers data on chain because of the Oracle problem. And that's the most common usage of Oracles. But what this paper introduces is a aspect of off-chain computation. And that off-chain computation is what allows for that scalability, that privacy. And in particular, the creation of hybrid smart contracts, which are essentially contracts that operate both on the blockchain and off the blockchain at the same time. They have two different components where one part is on like Ethereum and the other would be on a DAWN, a decentralized Oracle network. And that basically provides the best of both worlds. 
you get the immutability and the security of the blockchain with the connectivity, the flexibility, scalability, and privacy of that off-chain Oracle network. So different than Chainlink networks today, which are primarily uh, data delivery, these DAWNs basically extend the capability of existing blockchain networks. So they're, you know, these DAWNs, they're not trying to be blockchains. What they're trying to do is make smart contracts on existing blockchains even better than before. And so it, 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 the paper really dives into like how this works from like a implementation perspective, what you can do with it. But essentially it's creating these new type of hybrid contracts. And one of the terms introduced was a decentralized meta layer. And how I kind of see that as it's essentially the collection of all of these different dons, essentially. So when you have a smart contract, some of it may be on chain, but ideally as little as possible would be. That way you could have most of the computation off chain so you can lower the costs and increase the capabilities. So this decentralized meta layer would essentially be like the substrate through which these hybrid contracts would operate upon as more and more of the operation of what a contract does moves from on chain and moves to off chain. So it kind of, it kind of captures that broad idea but I think like hybrid smart contracts, that's like, that's the new thing here. That's what's being enabled by these new Dawn networks, essentially. Got it. So hybrid essentially stands for securely combining on-chain and off-chain components within a smart contract and essentially evolving not only the technology, but also our conceptualized understanding of what a smart contract is right now and what is going to be in the future um, with also Chainlink's vision to conceptualize what meta contracts are going to be. And I b- believe, like you mentioned, they're going to be mainly operated on the meta layer, which is introduced also in this paper um, and defined as um, a decentralized Oracle network meta layer. Now, where, where do you think that meta layer will reside? Will it reside essentially in the plain side between different blockchain and between different oracles um, and off-chain and on-chain feeds? Or there's a specific place for that meta layer um, within different blockchains or even the settlement layer? So with the meta layer, it's more of like a, it's kind of an abstract concept where it's not referring to a single network or a single thing but it's more like referring to the Chainlink ecosystem and its infrastructure as a whole. So it's the, the, it's meta in the sense that it's coordinating the operation of these contracts. And within the meta layer, it consists of all these different DAWNs and these DAWNs are anchored to a main chain. So essentially a meta layer, it wouldn't necessarily include a blockchain, but it would enhance a blockchain. It would make blockchains and existing layer two networks uh, even better than before. And with the term meta contract, you can kind of think of that as a more evolved version of a hybrid contract, Mm -hmm. hybrid contracts operating on chain and off chain. And so is a meta contract, but a meta contract is much more of that computation happening off chain. So it's, it's, it's almost like it's an off chain contract with a little bit of on chain components. And that creates a much more, flexible application. So it's kind of, it's like on a spectrum. If you have a static contract on the left, or I mean like just on-chain code on the left, Mm -hmm. and you have meta contracts on the right, the hybrid smart contracts would basically be in the middle and it would be that entire spectrum of, you know, you can have a little bit happening off-chain, you can have a lot happening off-chain, but the ultimate goal is to try and move a lot of that off-chain so you can decrease the costs and introduce privacy, order fairness, you know, while maintaining trust minimization, uh, which is achieved through this uh, explicit staking of link and the other trust minimization methods, essentially. So you, you want to get the security of the blockchain while getting the scalability and efficiency of DONS at the same time. Got it. And essentially, the staking plays a big role into um, playing the security um, well, providing the security for the hybrid and meta contracts. Um, but also, it seems to me the main driving force for the meta contracts is to reduce the conge- uh, congestion 
on the blockchains that those smart contracts essentially operate. Um, an example would be Ethereum um, to reduce the gas costs and reduce the con uh, essentially the congestion um, of the flow to make sure that net net everybody is receiving a lower net gas fee for that transaction. Because, and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, each and every computation that happens on chain considered to be as a transaction that uses the, in the Ethereum case, uh, gas, right? Right, yeah. So every transaction, the more complex the transaction, the more expensive it becomes. Mm -hmm. So you wanna try and minimize that and move things off chain. Therefore, you keep the transaction fees low because we've seen a lot of retail like get priced out of Ethereum, unfortunately. You know, not everybody can do hundreds of dollars in transaction fees, and that's entirely entirely understandable. I think layer two solutions, which are like a layer on top of blockchains, which scale computation, mm -hmm. that'll help a lot. But that's kind of why we've seen things like Binance Smart Chain pop up where, yeah, it's basically completely centralized, but it gives people the pseudo experience of interacting with smart contracts. So I think Dons will help a lot with scaling these contracts by moving the computations that don't necessarily need to happen off on chain and move that off chain. It seems like Chainlink also plays a big role in the layer two, um, just given their positioning with hy hybrid and meta contracts, the way that they're gonna be uh, prioritizing off chain computation. Um, it feels like this is one of the reasons for them doing so to prepare themselves for the layer two. I, I would say there's kind of a, there's a couple different dynamics. I think that layer twos, they're entirely complementary with Dons because a layer two is still like a blockchain. They can't connect to external resources. They don't generally have privacy or order fairness. So you'll, you'll, you could still use a Dawn to enhance existing layer two networks. And the other dynamic where you could consider a Dawn to be a layer two, but it's not a generalized layer two. It's like a application specific layer two. You know, some Dons are just going to be delivering price data. Some Dons may just be executing options contracts. Like it's not a generalized layer two, like you would see with Arbitrum or Optimism. It's mm -hmm. more application specific. Is it, you know, just providing privacy for the execution of derivatives contracts and a Dawn network is anchored to a main chain as it's put in the paper. And that can be any blockchain like Ethereum, or it could be any layer two network. So you can actually get the benefits of the generalized nature of existing layer two networks. Like we see with these optimistic rollups like Arbitrum and Optimism. Mm -hmm. And you can combine that benefits with more application specific Dawns to enhance specific contracts on that layer two. But in the sense of like scaling computation, it's essentially in the same vein, you know, layer two moves things off chain. That's basically what a Dawn is doing as well. Mm -hmm. But the, what it's moving off chain and how it does it is quite different than more generalized layer two networks. So I think they're entirely complementary. Got it. That's very fascinating. But also given their innovation with hybrid smart contracts and meta contracts, they're net net abstracting away the complexity, which is essentially um, the second point within their white paper, where DONs essentially enable enterprises to connect their existing systems to um, a broadening array of different blockchains. For example, you mentioned uh, Binance blockchain um, and Ethereum, and we know of some others like Polkadot um, systems essentially without a need of specialized expertise. Um, and given the finance 1.0 um, interpretation of blockchain and their rapid advancement into this new space, the abstracting away complexity means a lot to essentially the whole blockchain space overall. Yeah, with, with this point, there's kind of two dynamics. There's a developer's perspective when you're creating a contract and it just lives on chain, that's like a single monolithic application. It's fairly simple to create. When you're creating hybrid contracts and you have to have an on-chain portion and an off-chain portion, that may be a little more advanced. Mm -hmm. So what's introduced in the paper is a compiler where you would write your application just as you do today. You put it through this compiler and it would automatically split it into its on-chain and off-chain components. 
And that on-chain component could be deployed to any blockchain. Off-chain can be any DAWN network and connect to any external services. So it basically allows developers to write contracts like they do today, but they get the benefits of it being a hybrid contract that runs on-chain and off-chain components. And with this, because you can deploy that on-chain code on any blockchain, Chainlink oracles essentially act like, as you said, an enterprise gateway or like Mm -hmm. a blockchain abstraction layer where there's going to be a lot of different blockchains out there and particularly like enterprise chains and getting developers to integrate an enterprise's backend into each individual blockchain is probably going to be very expensive and just not practical. But what an enterprise could do instead is just integrate a Dawn network once and now they have access to every blockchain network in which they would want to do commerce or make transactions on. You know, if you're an entity and you're making transactions on Quorum, which is like the enterprise version of Ethereum, and you're in the US, but you have a business partner in China and they're using the BSN network, the blockchain service network, Mm -hmm. you, you need a connection. You need to be able to do commerce on a network you weren't integrated with before. You know, you could integrate each time, but every time you encounter a new blockchain, it's a whole entire new integration. But if you just do a Dawn, then it doesn't matter where your counterparties are doing their contract agreements on, you automatically get to support all blockchains at the same time. So this simplicity is both for developers writing contracts and for enterprises who wanna get their backend system, which secures trillions of dollars they've invested decades of years creating. There's tens of thousands of employees who know how to use that backend system. They can't just rip it out and place it with the blockchain. But what they can use is the Chainlink middleware to connect their backend system to every possible blockchain that exists today or will exist into the future. So I think that's a very profound feature of Chainlink in addition to Oracle services that is a little more hidden because it's more enterprise and maybe more boring. But I think it's a very impactful use case of Chainlink to simplify things for everybody, not just the enterprise. But it's also not only impactful but for the blockchain, but just overall for general finance, given that majority of them currently struggle with porting over their backend systems into any given blockchain. So what you're saying is, given the production of DONs, Chainlink will give them an ability to connect to any current and any future blockchain given that metal layer. Right. It wouldn't, like, it doesn't necessarily have to be like an international enterprise. It could be a mom and pop shop, or it could be a a money transfer, or it could be a financial institution. It doesn't matter because Chainlink is generalized. So, you know, it's going to be much cheaper, much more practical for a corporation of any size, any scale to just integrate once instead of integrating n times with all the blockchains that are gonna keep popping up all over the place. So it's, it's a lot more practical. It makes it a lot more simple to get not only the data from your backend system onto the blockchain so it can be used, like maybe it's a location of a package somewhere, but you can also read events on a blockchain and then export those into your backend system. So it's like a bi-directional communication bridge between your system and any blockchain network. And that has serious implications as the entire financial system and the entire global economy continues to move on chain. These existing systems aren't going away. They just become blockchain enabled. So you mentioned bi-directional, which is playing a big role in scaling, um, with essentially dons with different configurations running in parallel while minimizing the gas costs, which um, you just mentioned it would be equivalent for either a mom and pop shop or an international or global or local corporation um, with integrating with dons once and not having to deal with different blockchains at the same time. Essentially, it's a gateway to the blockchains. Yeah, it's it's that single gateway. Meta layer. The meta layer, yeah. yeah. <laughs> meta layer is kind of like the aggregation of dons. Like one, once you connect you're back into a dawn. Now you're a part of the metal layer, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> so it's, you know, whether it's going to happen inevitably that these systems are going to be connected to blockchains. Mm-hmm. Chainlink just makes it so much simpler. And it's not just delivering data, but it's moving it between systems and even moving data between different dawn networks, 
or moving something from like AWS uh, centralized cloud storage onto like a decentralized storage network like Filecoin. You know, you mm-hmm. can connect any on-chain or off-chain infrastructure in any combination. You could even use Chainlink to connect two different enterprise backends, both of which are entirely off-chain, but you can use Chainlink as that like common denominator routing through the Dawn network, which is anchored to a main chain for security. And then data could be transferred to another enterprise in a trust minimized way. So it's it's not just necessarily about moving data to and from blockchains. It's providing truth as a service. So you can move data in a way that hasn't been manipulated in a way mm-hmm. that's fully auditable between any possible system you could ever imagine. Whatever you just said, given my trading background, I just have so many ideas that a derivative products can be just born between different Oracle feeds that Chainlink has access to. And it just makes options very simple. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it just, it seems like in the future, you'll be able to create a derivative contract, um, maybe even a meta contract. Um, maybe that's what they're aiming for. Um, with different functionalities and expiration and trigger events or trigger codes for specific actions. Um, it seems like the whole world is essentially going to be, well, at least the Oracle network and the Oracle feeds are going to be optionalized. Um, it seems like to me by the financial industry once they get to it. But given the different access to so many feeds and Oracles and Dons, I feel like confidentiality has to play a big role in this. Um, and it seems like they also address this in the, their white paper 2.0. Yeah, it plays a pretty significant role, uh, particularly if, like for enterprise, you know, they can't release their trade secrets. They can't, they can't reveal what their business logic is because that's, you know, confidential information. You know, there's mm-hmm. regulations about that GDPR. So it's something that needs to be there So with Chainlink, it kind of provides privacy in a couple of different ways. You can keep data private. So you can use something like uh, Deco or Town Crier, which is a couple of Chainlink's technologies that use cryptographic proofs Mm -hmm. to uh, basically receive data from some system, use it to derive some data. So like, let's say, I I think it's most simple to explain as an example. So if, if you're trying to prove you're an accredited investor and you have at least $100,000 in your bank account, but you don't actually want to reveal how much money you have because that could be a security threat. Mm -hmm. You can use a Dawn network with Deco to ping your bank's server. It fetches how much you have and then it determines, okay, is this over 100,000? And if it's yes, then it just submits yes, backed by a proof. Or if it's not, then it's just no, but it never actually reveals the data. And that's more of like the data privacy aspect But when you have town crier and you have things like multi-party computation, where computations privately split across many different nodes within a Dawn, you can actually have a portion of the contract and its computation itself be entirely private. So in that way, you can keep the inputs, the logic and the outputs entirely private. And while that may not seem too important for like the transparency of DeFi like we have now, You know, it can prevent things like the front running of trades on a decentralized exchange, or it can prevent leaking private information of your users' data to the entire world, or preventing your, you know, your trade secrets from getting into the wrong hands. But you still want to use that data within a contract to prove something without revealing it. This kind of privacy and confidentiality, you really don't get that with blockchains. They're inherently transparent at least the most widely ones, widely used ones like Bitcoin and Ethereum. But if you combine the blockchain, which is public as like an anchor onto a Dawn, then the Dawn can do all the privacy computation, all the privacy uh, derived data, compute on that, and then just publish like a final output onto the blockchain. But that output can also be obscured. It could just be like a binary one zero value, which only has meaning to the contract parties themselves who know what the inputs were. So I think this confidentiality is going to be fundamentally required for the probably the most the vast majority of enterprise. They're not going to, you know, move all their processes on chain. They're going to slowly adopt it. But the more privacy technology we have, the faster 
they're able to realistically adopt these things, not just for regulatory reasons, GDPR, but also for their own self-interest of keeping their own data and their users' data private. And I think an interesting aspect, and this is kind of unrelated, but you can use a Dawn to have a decentralized identity system where users can have complete control of their own data and they can use a privacy mechanism like Deco to selectively reveal certain pieces of data to be used by other entities within some function, but without actually revealing the data. So you can get personally paid for the data you generate without just handing it over to like Facebook for free. But you can do that in a way that maintains your privacy and your confidentiality. I think, I think that has major implications beyond smart contracts, beyond DeFi, to just how people interact with other services. So kind of unrelated, kind of on the same note. I think privacy is a huge point of Don's. It seems like not only the privacy, but also keeping your information in your own hands and being the um, a self proprietor in terms of how you um, delegate the access of different systems to your data and whether or not you want to monetize it. Um, the one example that I can also bring from kind of banks or market makers, especially, whenever they have access to certain price feeds, um, they generally do not want to disclose what price fees they're tapping into just due to the nature of market making and what symbols they specialize in. So given this off-chain computation and essentially just a don't meta layer, um, it seems to me they would be able to get access to the feeds without revealing their actual symbols and positions. Uh, whereas currently in some of the infrastructures, you would have to do encryption on both both ends um, at rest and in transit uh, to make sure that data is safe. Yeah, I think that's a pretty huge point. A lot of like, even not just necessarily like market makers, but traditional data providers, they their entire business revolves around their data. But when you post data on a blockchain, it's immediately available to everyone. Anyone mm -hmm. off-chain can view it for completely free because blockchains are transparent. So if you're a traditional premium data provider and you want to continue monetizing your data, but you can't give up, you, know, you can't just give everybody access because you lose your cash flows, you can use Chainlink and Dons like Deco to allow contracts to use your data, but only within a Don privately. So the outputs of that Don will be derived from that data, but the data itself is never revealed. So, you know, the data providers we see delivering data to the blockchain, that's like 1% of the data providers available. The other 99% just can't reveal their data like that. And having the data provider run an Oracle node themselves, which a lot of data providers do on the Chainlink network, that doesn't really solve the problem either because they're still making their data publicly available. But if they can use privacy preserving mechanisms, they can significantly increase their revenue without the trade-offs of giving everybody access to their proprietary data. And that's, you know, important, not just like DeFi feeds, but also like medical research studies. You know, if, if you want to aggregate data from a lot of different hospitals and institutions, but there's, you know, you can't get into HIPAA violations, you can use a Dawn to aggregate this data do some AI analysis on it, generate an output and do all that without actually revealing any of the personal medical information of each participant. So it benefits the research community, it benefits the financial economy, it benefits the data providers, it benefits the users most importantly because they can keep their own data private. They can monetize it if they so choose. If they choose not to, then nobody else can access their data because it's in their own hands. That's an incredibly powerful concept, in my opinion. That's just essentially revolutionizing, given the current um, place where the whole social economy is realized, where the majority of that is essentially outsourced to centralized entities and centralized entities control that information. This is a very, very powerful idea. And it seems to be it's also in the process of being executed fairly quickly. Um, yeah, another very... Go ahead. I was going to say, I think that one of the technologies, it's called Candid, which was a paper written by Ari Jules, who also wrote this Chainlink 2.0 paper, mm -hmm. essentially describing how you can create a decentralized identity system 
that's backwards compatible with our existing infrastructure because you have to have like each user has an identifier and then each uh, entity can issue like certificates saying this identifier, you know, has this property, but that you have to bootstrap an ecosystem and that's really hard. But if you can use, do it in a backwards compatible way, that vastly simplifies the problem. And you can bootstrap these candid identity networks using Dawn networks essentially. So I think it's something that'll happen sooner than later. It's probably something we'll see after DeFi is more solidified and more institutionalized, more uh, grounded, and mm -hmm. it's just more scaled up, essentially. I think the next thing will be decentralized identity. And there'll be a lot of different solutions, but the solution that could be backwards compatible will be the one that's most widely used, and it'll be powered by Chainlink, of course. It seems like it makes perfect sense whenever the layer two rolls out and whenever the gas costs essentially net net lowered for any transaction because that would itself um, increase the congestion on the system. And also you'll you'll need a institutional approval on that level to have the data essentially in the hands of the users. But that data, um, like an order transaction data, um, is the next point within their paper, which is order fairness for transactions. And that seems to be a big, big topic lately with a lot of um, front running questions, um, a lot of bots essentially on decentralized exchanges um, and some other side topics like flash bots. Um, but seems like uh, the introduction of fair sequencing services, short for FFS, helps with fair ordering um, for transactions and avoids front running, back running, and related attacks on user transactions, um, as well as any other types of transactions. Yeah, this the fair ordering of transactions. A blockchain can guarantee like a user has funds to make a payment or something, mm -hmm. but they can't guarantee that the time you submit a transaction, it'll be ordered before the transactions that come afterwards. That's not how blockchains work. And what that, that dynamic creates is what's called minor extractable value, or commonly called MEV, mm -hmm. where a miner ultimately has control of how they order transactions within their blocks that they produce, and they can use that power to basically siphon value from users. They can insert a buy trade before another user's buy trade, and then sell afterwards, and then profit the difference. So the user just gets way worse slippage than they were initially expecting, and it's a terrible user experience and then when you take it to the extreme, it can have consensus issues. It can destroy a blockchain as miners basically keep trying to extract all the value they can until there's mm -hmm. nothing left. So what FSS basically uh, provides a solution to, or how it provides a solution is essentially separating the creation of blocks by miners and the ordering of transactions within that block. So the um, ordering of transactions would happen in a Dawn network. And that Dawn network can order user transactions using any policy. And usually that would probably be like first seen. So first in, first out, essentially, mm -hmm. which blockchains today do it by the highest fee first, which is easy for arbitrage bots. It's easy for miners to manipulate. But with FSS, it's a, like an opt-in service that developers will be able to use to define a specific ordering policy to not only prevent like the front running of user trades, but also like the front running of Oracle updates or any type of transaction misordering in a manipulated way. So the paper really dives into the detail on this one, essentially covering how this exactly works. Mm -hmm. But essentially it's taking this ordering and doing it on a Dawn network. And there's other ways you can keep the data private, different ways you can submit a transaction, but essentially it's creating more fairness for users and ultimately as a side effect, lowering gas costs, transaction fees, because with front running, it's, it creates a gas war where these arbitrage bots keep bidding up the, the amount of fees that they're willing to pay to a miner. And that increases the network transaction costs for everybody. But if you completely get rid of that dynamic, then you could basically solve that issue and it won't completely eliminate gas issues, but it'll reduce it. So with, with FSS on the layer one, it's like an opt-in service where you have to like, you, you connect FSS to your contract specifically. But I think the interesting approach is on layer two, 
you can have a layer two network use FSS by default for all transactions. So it doesn't matter what contract you interact with, you know it'll be fairly ordered. And that's a lot easier when you're spinning up a new layer two, you could just use FSS right away instead of trying to working it back into a layer one and doing a hard fork and consensus and it's more complicated. So it's it's backwards compatible on a layer two and layer, oh, it's backwards compatible on a layer one. It can be backwards compatible on a layer two or it could just order everything by default on a layer two. So I think MEV will continue to be a large sticking point, especially as more miners keep extracting it with flash bots. We'll need a solution. And I think FSS is a fairly optimal solution to this issue. It seems like FSS would also be very beneficial in its traditional finance and market making. Um, there's been a lot of questions rising about the payment for order flow and how that is being used within the market makers um, and whether or not the retail guys or institutional guys on the other end receive a fair price. Now that has been sort of disputed over the years that overall price improvement has been there, but I haven't seen any data supporting that with the flashbots or MAV uh, benefiting the front end users, the retail traders, or any sort of traders that are utilizing the transactions on, on the blockchain um, as a benefit to the users. It seems like majority of that benefit relies specifically for the decentralized exchanges um, because they essentially extract the value from the order feed, matching, uh, matching the orders to their benefit and extracting certain value from essentially market making. Yeah, in the MEV space, there's kind of two dynamics. There is a making MEV more fair and then make preventing MEV. So Flash Boss, it's kind of, <laughs> their entire goal is to like democratize MEV. So like, it's not just like a cabal of miners secretly ordering transactions, but it could be done for everybody, which, you know, sure you democratized it, but you didn't prevent it. Users don't get a difference. In fact, now they're getting front run more than ever than before, it's, it's, it, do, it doesn't provide a definitive solution. So what you ultimately need is some type of ordering service, some type of way to prevent MEV from happening in the first place, you know, democratizing it, sure, but that's not gonna solve the problem. So I think FSS and particularly with like additional privacy mechanisms, like a commit and reveal scheme or uh, encrypting your transaction, then the Don orders it and then it's unencrypted that way, even if the Don wanted to manipulate the ordering, it wouldn't know what any of the transactions are actually for. So, you know, th those are like the concrete ways, requires a little engineering work, but that's the way that MEV will ultimately end up being solved, while Flashbots is more of a, I don't want to say a Band-Aid, because it's not really attempting to solve it. It's just trying to make it more fair. But, you know, now all the mining pools, most of them on Ethereum are using Flashbots which to provide context to people, Flashbots is basically a way a miner can delegate, basically allows people to submit specific batches of transactions in a certain order and give it to a miner and pay the miner for allowing them to put transactions in a specific order within their block. And a lot more miners are using Flashbots now and it democratizes it, but it makes MEV more prevalent, which makes the need for solutions all the more apparent like FSS. I agree. And it seems like that um, MAV, which is primarily functions within the minor space, um, and that, to me at least, is one of the main reasons why Ethereum is trying to go from proof from miners to proof of stake. Or do you think during the staking, because we'll get to that in a moment, how Chainlink is going to be providing that. Um, the minor uh, extraction value is still possible with those types of orders. I, I don't think proof of stake would really change anything. I mean, maybe the name would change to stake, staker val <laughs> extractable value or something. But, but it, it doesn't really solve it because now you just moved who orders the transactions from miners to stakers. So you didn't really fix the problem. You just kind of changed the entity who does the manipulation and they could still have like a flash bots type system to outsource that. So I wish it solved it, but I, I don't think it, it does solve it. So we'll still need some kind of external solution for that. Interesting. 
governance. But chain link crypto economic security essentially is driving um, the new ideology of how the security of the network is going to be operating um, and whether or not it will allow certain um, attacks and into the sovereignty of the blockchain itself. Like we've seen some examples of that a year ago with the flash loans um, on certain protocols. To me, it seems like chain link crypto economic security leverages the community that providing the staking as a leverage to the security. Yeah, with crypto economic security, it's kind of a it's a broad spectrum thing. I, I can kind of give an overview. I think it'd be helpful for people. Mm -hmm. There's like a an implicit incentives aspect of it, where because all the nodes are being paid in the link token, and because you know the revenue is denominated in link, and that's what they ultimately will end up having to stake. They're financially exposed to the health of the network. So if the network becomes corrupted and the value of link drops because of the loss of confidence, then that's a direct or more indirect, but it's a it's an economic consequence for the network participants who hold link and get paid in link, you know, and that's yeah. kind of flows into another implicit incentive with future fee opportunity where a malicious node would basically forfeit all of their future revenue between the networks they are malicious in, all the other networks they currently serve, and, and any of the future networks they could have potentially been added to. So, you know, if a node is to be bribed, you can't just bribe them for the revenue they would make during that that specific job. You have to bribe them for all the future revenue that they would generate in the network. So, and that, that becomes expensive, especially as yeah. adoption just keeps going exponential. And, and it's almost unpredictable. And given the super linear staking, it just will become exponentially more expensive. And it seems like, right. it seems like whenever the attacker is being caught with their malicious feed. Um, they're being penalized across of essentially their whole supply chain of the data that they're providing, right? So a little bit, yeah, With it kind of depends on a network by network basis. That's kind of where it gets into more of the explicit staking aspect where each Dawn network has like a specific service agreement defining the performance of how each node needs to operate. And each node deposits a stake in link tokens and essentially, the staking mechanism achieves a super linear impact where the amount of funds that a malicious actor needs to bribe a network is quadratically larger than the amount of stake actually deposited in that network. And it's a pretty powerful mechanism, but it's essentially providing security, even if the malicious, even if the majority of nodes in a DAWN are malicious, you still have protections and they can still get slashed because of the uh, alerting mechanism that's used essentially. So it's the staking mechanism is really designed to prevent more advanced attacks like prospective bribery where you choose who to bribe based on their uh, position in the network, their job. But it also provides that super linear staking impact where it just becomes more and more expensive as every additional node is added to a network. And you combine that with the existing implicit incentives that already exist in the network today it just becomes completely economically impractical, nearly impossible to attack a network. And you can't realistically protect a network against an adversary with unlimited funds with the money printer, but you can make it exceptionally expensive and impractical for any realistic adversary where it's more profitable to be honest. And that's the ultimate incentive that crypto networks in general aim to achieve, but Chainlink specifically for the creation of correct Oracle reports. Yeah, it seems like Chainlink is especially on the front end of revolutionizing what we understand um, in the current financial system of profit taking, where the majority of um, the human history, and at least in the last couple of hundred years, the winners were rewarded for cheating the system or bribing the system, whereas this proposes a very contrary contrarian thought in the current society where truth actually is more profitable than being an adversary of the truth. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a pretty interesting way of looking at it. You can kind of think of chain link as like a definitive truth as a service. And how does it determine that truth? Well, it can't be based in bribes and lies. Like that wouldn't make any sense. <laughs> so you have to have some kind of system to ensure that each node has a reason to be honest. 
you know, not because they want to do it out of the goodness of their heart. That's not mm-hmm. scalable. They need an economic reason. They need to make money. You know, that that's what drives people. That's what drives the actions of people is how they make money. So that that's kind of how Chainlink achieves its security, where if a Oracle report is created and it's wrong, anybody in that network can raise an alert and they have the opportunity to win the slashed stake of all the malicious nodes in that network. And, you know, that's a large economic incentive to report false activity. It's kind of, it's almost like getting paid for snitching on the other nodes in the network, <laughs> essentially. But I mean, it's, it, it's pretty conceptually simple, but it's just, it works with these, basically a minority of the network raising alerts that the malicious or the majority is being malicious. It goes to this second tier network of a more a high security, high trust network with many more nodes, many more data sources and security methodologies like cryptographic proofs. That way, there's just an incredibly strong incentive to raise an alert that some nodes are lying in the network. You know, if we had something like that in politics, <laughs> it would be completely different. I don't know how that would work, transferring mm-hmm. technology over to that. But it, yeah, 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 you have to generate truth based on the foundation of truth. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Yeah, you probably in that kind of world with politics being involved, you would probably have to have some sort of a token that you will be able to vote and use that leverage to your advantage. But then if you're trying to be bribed, you can call them out on it and take their whole worth of network to you, or at least to a subsection of what the network provides. That's a very powerful thought. (laughs) Yeah, and that's... Paper doesn't really get into that broad of concept, but <laughs> I, I could see how this mechanism, I mean, you're basically a minority of nodes and that minority could be any node has the power to determine the, not determine, but like to raise an alert that the majority is being malicious. And that's just, you know, that's not something we have today. If the majority is malicious and you're getting fed bad data, you, it's going to be hard as hell to convince people that that data is bad because the majority is telling them it's good data even if it's not, but but chain like, you know, it's all about like quantifying the security. How much does it actually cost to attack a network? And if the reward of attacking a network is lower than the cost, then it's never going to be attacked. You know, it's, it's kind of just a simple math function. You want to keep that cost of attack as high as possible and ensure that people have access to definitive truth, which can ultimately end up being used for external real world services that humans use. So in a way that it will, we'll end up seeing this mechanism used in the real world. It'll just be securing the infrastructure that provides us the truth of what is true and not. It's just a tremendous, powerful ideology that's been introduced into the world. I think it will take a lot of people some time to get used to it, but overall it will simplify both the developers to build systems on top of a very trust, um, I don't want to use the word trustworthy, but a trust generating system, um, knowing ins and outs of it, but at the same time, give an ability of the users and the confidentiality to be a staker, be provider of the information within the architecture and the infrastructure. It's something that I don't think we've ever encountered before maybe Bitcoin came about, where we have a decentralized ledger of confirming each and every transaction and coming to consensus. Here we're talking about a wide array of applications where definitive truth can serve not only the capitalists of the society, but also people who just want to have their own data through their own hands. Yeah, I completely agree. I think we've seen definitive truth like Bitcoin, we have definitive truth of who owns Bitcoin. We have definitive truth on Ethereum about like who owns what token and how much token do they have. But if you want to know like, hey, who actually won the presidential election? You know, what what is the price of gold right now? You know, what's the price of a house in Argentina? Blockchain is not going to help you with that. You can put it on chain, but if it's garbage in, garbage out. So like Chainlink, it like expands. What are we creating definitive truth about? Right now, people think it's just price feeds, but that's like that's just the product market fit. You know, that, that's the first thing. The ultimate goal is to achieve definitive truth about anything and everything in which people would be interested in. 
particularly contracts, because that controls value and money. And people care about money. Mm -hmm. But realistically, you could use a Dawn to generate truth about any kind of event, any type of asset, really anything that has an ability to be measured. You can generate some kind of distributed crypto economically secured trust. And I think that's the differentiator here is that it's not just decentralized, but it's backed by crypto economics. So it's not an assumption that it's honest. It's only an assumption that we have rational economic actors who aren't masochists and don't want to hurt their own wallet. You know, that's a pretty strong assumption right there, which, well, a weak one, which is actually a good one. So yeah, I think Chainlink's really just a truth as a service. And that that's so broad. Smart contracts, they're awesome. And that's like where Chainlink's going to be used for like the next decade. But if we're thinking beyond the next decade, I think it'll be a generalized truth as a service for humans directly. Yeah, it's it's not that far away, a decade away. I'm sure we'll be here. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> it's yeah, yeah it's you. definitely revolutionary in terms of the way that the team is thinking about it, the team is implementing. Um, and like you mentioned, the price fit is just a product market fit just to get into the industry and show what the technology and the team is capable of. And now we have randomness, now we have Deco onboarding with every jewels. Um, and again, Chainlink white paper 2.0. How many, how many blockchains do we have that have white paper 2.0? I don't know any. <laughs> yeah, I don't know any either. Not not on the same level as this. Not even close. Definitely not even close. I definitely encourage each and every one who's listening to give it a shot and try to read the white paper. It's about 136 pages. Um, if not, dive into some of the information that sums up on the Chainlink official website and follow Chainlink God at Chainlink God um, on Twitter. He provides a lot of value and describes each and every um, information that's provided by the chain link. And it's such a simple matter that even a kid from a kindergarten can understand. But with that said, CLG, Chainlink God, thank you so much for joining today. You've probably opened eyes to a lot of people uh you've provided us with definitive truth <laughs> about the white paper itself where can people find you so primarily twitter that'd be the main place um if you're interested in the white paper i also recorded a podcast recently where it's just me talking for like an hour about it so more information there in addition to this recording and yeah i just want to say thanks for bringing me on i know i'm always happy to to educate about Chainlink definitive truth about any and all things. So I also recommend checking out protocol value at protocol value on Twitter. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, it was definitely a pleasure having a conversation. Hopefully we'll have you for Chainlink white paper 3.0, 4.0, 5.0, <laughs> and whatever we have uh, coming towards us, uh, simple human beings from the Chainlink community. Again, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you everyone who stayed until the very end of this episode. If you like this episode, please give us five stars on your preferred platform of listening this episode. And don't forget to subscribe because we have a lot more guests coming in and talking to us regarding the Bitcoin, blockchain, DeFi and the smart contract economy. But until then, you guys have a wonderful day and we'll see you in the next one.